This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Adam Toos, Professor of History and the Director of the European Institute at Columbia University. Today, we're going to talk about his book, Shut Down, How COVID Shook the World, or the world's economy, I should say. It shook the world. But a lot of times I find that historians look back and project forward with selective interpretation of the evidence based on what they want. He has a much broader lens, and so I really look forward to talking with you. Thanks for joining me today, Ed. Pleasure to be here. So let's start with, you mentioned a whole constellation of problems, but COVID shows up on stage, and whether it's climate, racial injustice, economic inequality, the globalization and balance of power in the world, or disease itself. How do you t tell us your vision? What, first of all, what inspired you to write the book? What brought it to you? Well, kind focus? of, um, uh, it was a book written almost out of necessity, to be honest. Um, it wasn't my plan. Um, I mean, like everyone else, um, practically everyone else in the world, I imagine it, that COVID totally derailed my life. Um, it derailed my family's life, my circumstances of living in New York. And I was it, was, it was embarked on a book about the political economy of climate, which, which will be the next book that I do after mm -hmm. shutdown. Um, but found, as it were, history catching up with me, because I'd done this narrative of 2008, which was itself, of course, distilled out of the reportage of journalists, econom economists, think tanks, bank economists, and so on. And had become quite influential as a way of thinking about 2008. And all of a sudden, as you know, in the, in the second week of March 2020, we started seeing reductions in the financial markets, um, in, in Treasury repo in particular, that were frankly terrifying, were immediately legible in terms of the schema which people in macro finance, critical macro finance, had developed for understanding 2008-9, and I just, my life was just taken over by commentary, chatting with journalists, friends, economists about the, the, the urgency of this crisis. And at some point, I just, the, the tension between living the 2008 crisis, uh, sorry, living the 2020 crisis whilst mm -hmm. attempting to research the energy policies of Carter, just, I, it was impossible. <laughs> and uh, and I'd never experienced that before because I I'll be honest like well when 2008 was going on I was writing about World War One and I wasn't really paying attention and what happened as you know with the 2008 book is it got caught up in the in the in the backdraft of the Trump election and Brexit and and that book just didn't end on me I couldn't I couldn't close it out and Duncan Weldon who writes for the Economist now teased me at the time saying that you're gonna to have to write an endless new edition aren't you <laughs> and way and lo and behold that's exactly what I found myself doing so this book is really a response to that like crashed but even more directly it grew out of almost daily commentary on events Mm -hmm. And those uh, readers who, who are familiar with either the geopolitical debates about American relations with China or the Eurozone, um, who follow you know, commentary on the emerging markets, Latin America in particular, but those most particularly who were deep in the action in the Treasury markets in the spring of last year will recognize, I hope, the urgency of the conversation, which is still ongoing. The G30 just brought out a set of recommendations for the reform of the Treasury market a couple of weeks ago. And it's hard to exaggerate the importance of that, right? This is this goes way beyond Lehman because the Treasury market is the Alpha and Omega, the fundamental foundation. It's the safe asset for the global economy. Mm -hmm. And it gives you an indication of quite how serious this was, that that was, that was shaking. So 2020 for me, just once more, took the lid off. You know, if, if we... I mean, for me, the challenge of, of history writing and contemporary commentary is to grasp just the radicalism of the world that we're in. I mean, as you say, like I'm shy about predicting the future because I find the present so overwhelming. <laughs> and yeah. and um, 2020, the, the, by way of the, the, the COVID crisis, we, as it were, I think, lifted the lid on, on, on the cauldron that we're, that we're perched on top of. And the, the book tries to convey that sense of, well, I use this term polycrisis. Jean-Claude Juncker coined it. It's from Edgar Morin, who's like a theorist of complexity. And 
Juncker was trying to capture the mess the Eurozone and Europe was in in 2015, where you had Ukraine and the refugee crisis and Greece and populism boiling up in Poland and Britain. And in a sense, this is an effort to understand a similar poly crisis in 2020. Yeah. So let's talk, let's kind of zoom in on some of the different pieces. What did you find startling? What did you find positive? What did you find most disconcerting about the reaction to the COVID crisis? The response, I should say. Well, the surprise is the sheer scale of fiscal and monetary action. The disappointment yeah. is that we ended up needing it, right? So the disappointment is the total failure of public health in place after place around the world. Mm -hmm. If you look back, I mean, it's not fair to say that economists, I don't make this point in the book as strongly as I wish I had in retrospect, but you know, if you look at, say, economists studying pandemics before 2020, and there were plenty of people who were, there's a paper actually co-authored by Larry Summers, I think from 2018, that estimates the impact of a pandemic the mm -hmm. flu pandemic. One of the interesting things about those is they assume the mortality and the damage will be severest in low income countries and emerging market economies in terms of mortality. And so then they ratio up and they conclude that the economic damage will be modest. Whereas what we were confronted with in 2020 is the total failure of public health in the core elements of the global economy. First in China, and we shouldn't underestimate how serious that failure was, though they then managed to establish a grip on it better than other places then in Europe and then in the United States. So we took out what, what, you know, what amounts to basically 60% plus of the global economy, an even bigger share of trade. And, and that's just a staggering shock. So then the reaction had to be big. And the least you can say about it was it was prompt and large. And though, of course, the protagonists will go to their graves denying that there was any real explicit coordination of monetary and fiscal policy and so on, de facto, it actually formed a fairly functionally integrated whole, and not just within countries, but globally. And that's, as it were, the surprise. The positive news, the one big piece of positive news, and it's integrally related to this, it's just a different sector of the economy, is, of course, the vaccine story. So the fact that the pharma-industrial complex, when prodded, pushed, mobilised, adequately funded, was able to deliver not one, but like you know a whole suite of vaccines, suitable mm -hmm. for different contexts at different price points, you know, is, is remarkable testimony to what we have there if we want to mobilise it and we're sufficiently, you know, intelligent and capable of collective action to mobilise it. We have an incredible tool there. Um, what we've seen since, of course, is the disappointing shambles of the failure to roll out. And go so those would be the three disappointment, surprise, you know, I mean, really deeply impressive um, bio biotech biomedical performance yeah. and then they, new disappointment out the end in a sense yeah they rose to the challenge but they didn't get it injected to enough the arms. system yeah. of the the people all over yeah. the world and they didn't build which now is creating them. mutant yeah. variants that are flowing back yeah. and how would i say by saving a few billion dollars or protecting intellectual property rights we're going to cost macro economies trillions more I mean, I'm not sure whether I buy the patent story. I mean, I'm by no means an expert here, but my sense is that the smart money says that patents are a huge symbolic issue, and the fact that they've dug in their heels and are trying to protect them is just like terrible politics. But the the real bottleneck here is production productive capacity, which is a mm -hmm. lot of embodied mm -hmm. knowledge. It's very difficult mm -hmm. to do, and the mistake for the fancy mRNA vaccines was not from the very beginning to go really big and say, look, we're going to have to mass produce these all over the world. So yeah. they did that with AstraZeneca and it had the checkered history that it's had, but they incorporated Serum Institute, which is the world's biggest production capacity. Mm -hmm. And what we really need clearly around the world are several more Serum Institutes, low yeah. cost, high quality, emerging market production hubs that yeah. can take expertise from around the world at world-class level, rapidly incorporated into production and then go. Serum doesn't, isn't a groundbreaking research institute in its own right, but it's totally groundbreaking in that it can do a, mil, you know, a billion doses yep. in India. So what we yep. need is six of those. 
Yeah, as they um, say, R, it's R&D, it's the D part of R&D. It's the D yeah. and the D and the P, because this is all about production, right? It's, it's, yeah. We, yeah. It's, 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 you have to take it all the way down. And then, of course, what we need out the other end of that is logistics, supply, and that's when it gets really complicated, is you've got to yes. put boots on the ground and you've actually got to have systems that will deliver this. And emerging market mm -hmm. low-income countries are perfectly capable of this. Like Rwanda's done a much better job than many other places mm -hmm. at much higher levels of income, but you do need to build the in chain all the way. Yeah. And then coming back to the macro stimulus, this huge, like you said, the trillions of dollars. Uh, I know some people are concerned about the packages, say, of the Biden administration in the United States on the grounds of inflation. Mm -hmm. Others are more concerned about what you might call the opportunity costs of the use of fiscal capacity so that it how would, I say, would be structured in such a way that it enhanced productivity and took care of climate change rather than what, what you might call alleviated distress among the workforce. And, and so the, in essence, what they're saying is that was nice, but tomorrow when we really need it to head off climate change, or when we need to pay for it, had we expanded productive capacity and so forth, we're not going to be there. And mm -hmm. the, there's kind of a dead weight loss. This is just a loss. It doesn't generate future benefits or head off that climate crisis that was on the way. I think you're ventriloquizing some sort of sophisticated version of Blanchard or Larry Summers. <laughs> um, and I'm not out of sympathy with some elements of that critique. But I wouldn't put it quite that way. So, I mean, I think the inflation thing's overdone. Um, I don't understand why they're flogging that horse. Um, you know, say we did get some inflation. Like, the only reason I would worry about it is if that it bit into low incomes and wages were not adjusting right. quickly right. enough. That's a very real concern. Right. But we have, after all, learned a pretty simple right. lesson about how to alleviate poverty in societies like America or indeed Europe, which is A, in the European case, provide people with job security, which is what they did through short time, or in the American case, just print some checks and send people money. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the bite. The, the, the bigger concern I, I take as real is more about prioritization. And it is stunning that America did the largest set of stimulus packages ever, in ever, ever. Um, and they, don't, they basically contain no green element whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, if you add up the 2020 package, the rescue plan, and of course the idea is that that will be deferred, that the, down the line there is the big green investment package. To my mind, the problem there is not actual, as it were, budget capacity constraint, you know, debt sustainability. I think that's an arithmetic which we just don't need to be concerned with at this point. It's clear, however, that the political obstacles are real, particularly in the United States, if that's what we're mainly talking about here. Mm -hmm. There's only so much that you can get through the, you know, ridiculously constrained pipeline of American congressional legislation. And so that first Biden package, the rescue plan, which is very remarkable for being relatively pork free, right? In terms of delivering benefits yeah. to low income and middle income Americans, it's remarkably streamlined. There's not a lot of, you know, tax benefits for corporations and very rich people. The concession they had to make to get it through was on the minimum wage, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which bought off the Chamber of Commerce, and then they were they were they were okay with it. But I think there is a sense that that was a moment politically where they had momentum, where it was a shame not to do infrastructure, and the idea that you could then roll out the jobs plan and the families plan and do those next. Well, we'll see. Everything's still to be played for, but the momentum isn't what it was in the spring. And so that element of the summer's critique, which I think has been underplayed relative to the you know, scaremongering about inflation, I'm actually more sympathetic to. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it may be a rationalist you know, fallacy to imagine that you get to pick and choose this, right? The, the first stimulus of the Biden administration was driven by Congress. It wasn't, the impetus isn't really coming from the administration. It's, it's Schumer and Pelosi that already had lined this up the previous year, wanted to do something really big very quickly. And I think Yellen and the, the administration just sort of waved it through. I don't think it, the initiative really did come from them. The fact they were willing to wave it through is remarkable because that's very different mm -hmm. from 2009. And I wrote about this at the time. I, I do mm -hmm. think there is a break there. 
And I understand the political logic, which I think people like Paul Krugman have been articulating for some time, which is it's all about politics. And it's all really about the midterms. And anything that gets us through the midterms with the Democratic majority in Congress still intact, however thin it may be, is a win. So as you look at the, uh, how do you say, the snapshot of now, what do you see, how do I say, boiling in the cauldron? You see climate on the horizon, and it, and it might very well be that it's already boiling, meaning that the time horizon to meet two degrees is ticking away. We may be overdue, as the UN's recent report. Yeah, over 1.5, uh, we definitely us. are. Yeah, currently yeah. we're nowhere near what yeah. would be necessary for 1.5. Yeah. But in the realm of inequality, yeah. in the realm of trust in government, in the realm of which we haven't talked about, the world system in U.S.-China relations. What do you see right now that causes, gives you heartburn? Oh, well, any number of different things. I mean, the book concludes, as you say, open-endedly with a tour of, as it were, the vectors of tension, as I think I call them, that mm -hmm. exploded in 2020. And none of them are calming, right? None of them are, none of, none of those sources of tension are really being relieved. Inequality was increased. The dysfunction in the American political system is unabated. The tensions in Europe remain. The fundamental issues around Italian debt are unresolved. Um, the climate environmental envelope is being stressed ever more. Um, and we are not done with this virus after all. And um, absolutely, the tensions with China reached a scale and a ferocity and uh, an ideological intensity in 2020 that as a historian took me totally by surprise, in part because history was being invoked. You had people like Attorney General Barr, you know, lecturing American business about the fact that, quote unquote, we would all be speaking German, but for the fact that their predecessors had aligned themselves with the American state in its mission to, you know, uh, win World War II. And so the lesson from that was that they needed to get on board with a confrontation with China and a quite explicit um, uh, uh, attack on America's corporate elite as um, essentially complicit with appeasing the authoritarianism of China, which was then coupled with an attack on woke America, political correctness in the United States, a really comprehensive culture front, a culture war yeah. of, a, of, a, of McCarthy type. You know, it's not unfair, I think, to draw comparisons to the 50s. Uh, mm -hmm. and, but directed against American business. So whereas, whereas, you know, it might have been once upon a time, it might have been like, you know, liberal pinkos in the in the State Department, all of a sudden the targets here were were the heights of American business. And that's, that's very novel. And, and, you know, not on, you know, at the same time, counterflow, completely uninhibited, disinhibited moves by, you know, Ray Dalio, Bridgewater, all the big players in Wall Street as well, even to China. So, you know, talk about incoherence. Um, yeah. some, of, yeah. some of the tensions of which we've seen unloading this summer with, you know, the moves by regulators on both sides to sabotage or to undercut IPOs, which I think have really scared people. Um, but it, it's a profoundly unresolved um, situation at what, let's face it, was the driver of globalization. When we talk euphemistically mm -hmm. in general terms about globalization since the 1990s, what we really mean is the network of trading relations and manufacturing relations built around China. So to have that destabilized is right, it's historically, rad it's historically radical. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I, I remember years ago reading a, a book by a woman named Nancy Frazier. Uh, the old is dying and the young cannot be born. Just, uh, well, that's Gramsci. a paraphrase of Gramsci. Yes. And uh, what she was saying, in essence, was that there was distributional fights regarding gender and race. And that the Democratic Party, which used to represent, quote, the working class, I'm going back to Lyndon Johnson, Franklin Roosevelt, were now frightened by the success of Ronald Reagan. And they formed something called the Democratic Leadership Council, and then they went forward where their, what you might call, big donors became things like Wall Street or Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And to avoid being pushed out of office by what you might call the Reagan Democrats, is what they used to call them, that would migrate across, 
they had to adopt identity politics. So a lot of the gender and race issues are associated with a constructive and I think overdue agenda uh, within the Democratic Party. And what she predicted in the book, this is when Donald Trump was president, is that he had come in and said the system is rigged. The Reagan Democrats hadn't been able to dance to that kind of music in a long time through the Obama and Clinton years and what have you. So they migrated across, and Hillary lost to Trump, as we all know. But at that juncture, she said she predicted that Donald Trump would now abandon the people he hoodwinked into voting for him, and he would take up the identity politics agenda vis-a-vis -vis the beneficiaries of gender and racial mm -hmm. policy change to keep those people, despite the fact that he wasn't helping them, mm -hmm. to keep them on his side. And I just thought it was a brilliant vision at the time of something that didn't uh, get at a lot of the economic issues. Yeah. It, it, it just shifted, what you might call, to a different dimension of our politics. And what worries me right now is that I see and, and I applaud the progress that the Biden administration is experiencing or, or deservedly experiencing from the women, people of color, the change in the composition of appointments to the cabinet, first female treasury secretary, Janet Yellen. I mean, but all of these things I think are, are great and necessary. But a lot of my friends say the reason we're going to be tough on China is because that Reagan Democrat white working class crowd yeah. is going to go back to the Trumpians unless we stay hawkish on that frontier because they're resentful of the other one uh, in the echoes of Donald Trump's presidency. So I think, I think, uh, I know Martin Wolf at the FT is working on a book between about the tensions in the democracy of what I'll call plutocracy and identity and inequality, all the dimensions that you bring up. Uh, and it's, it's very hard to see this, what you might call strain or this stress being ameliorated and creating a broad-based consensus in America. And without that, it's very hard for America to be an example in leading the world. Yeah, I mean, I, we might come back to that, that final uh, point, which I do think is quite a stretch, but to um, focus on this issue of class and identity, um, I think, I think the, the obvious, you know, obvious insofar as it's, there, there is a solution is, is clearly the proposition from the left, which is to say, look, insofar as the, the appeal is, as it were, from plutocratic donors and upper middle class, highly educated, college educated, ID, um, ID, identity politics warriors, this is profoundly off-putting to most working Americans, in fact, many working Americans of colour, um, who, as we discovered in the most recent election, don't in fact warm to appeals to defund the police, as we've seen that in the New York City elections as well. Um, but the rational way to counter this is to say, who is the working class in the United States right now? And the working class in the United States today, of course, does include some burly white men of Irish or Polish or Anglo extraction wearing hard hats. But it also includes large numbers of people of colour. In fact, predominantly the race and class in the United States are, to a large extent, yes. the same problem. Yes. <laughs> African Americans yes. are as disenfranchised and um, as far down as they are in the pyramid of wealth because they're working class. One is an indicator of the other. Their yeah. kids go to bad schools, they have less chances of, of, of making progress and they are disadvantaged in a whole variety of other ways on top of the stigma of, of, of blackness uh, projected onto them and, and, and the criminalization they're subject yeah. to. And the same is true for women, obviously, a huge part of the working class workforce today are, are, is female. And so, mm -hmm. the, you know, a, a, a genuinely progressive strategy of mobilization would, would seek to abolish, right, this, this divide between a strategy of identity and a strategy of equality. I mean, that's, that's absurd. Um, 
And so you need to work on that. The question, I think, is, and, and to do that, you need constructive policies like the ones the Biden administration has tried to roll out. That is why I think they prioritized that first round of welfare spending, because they knew that constituencies of people, um, uh, working class people, precarious workers, whether they were white, black, Latino, men and women, but above all, of course, single parent women were in deep trouble and needed all the help they could get. They were facing a genuine social crisis. And then the, the jobs plan and the, the families plan are targeted specifically at those groups. And I, the, the most radical and innovative of them is it arguably the family plan, which focuses on the care economy, which is both crucial for working families and working mothers in particular, but also a sector which employs disproportionately women. So, so you know, that is the strategy. And I think that's an entirely positive strategy. And it's clearly the way in which you need to answer this invidious and in the end, I mean, I don't have a lot of time for identity politics detached from hierarchies of class. Well, you might not say that's surprising. I am who I am. I'm an extremely privileged upper middle class <coughs> white man from Europe. But I don't even think it's a terribly good read of the United States. The, the second question that follows on from that is how much of a price do you have to pay in terms of foreign policy antagonism to really cement that? And I'm not sure that you know, antagonism with China necessarily plays well with a broad segment of the American working class. It may work well for some sectors which sectors are that displaced, to yeah. vigorous competition, and a strategy of rebalancing there is, is, is clearly necessary. In political terms, mm -hmm. like, it's clearly, you know, it's a weak flank for the Democrats. The last thing the Biden administration needs is to be accused of being weak, soft on China, the campaign against China was already begun under Trump. Arguably, it goes back. I mean, it has democratic DNA as well. I would trace its origins to 2009, um, first phase of the Obama administration, that first visit, indeed, of President Obama to Beijing, which went very badly, and the period of the Clinton era at the State Department. I mean, Kurt Campbell and people like this who are calling the shots now are veterans of that period. So the third element is leadership. Um, I just think that's a Fata Morgana. I mean, it's a, it's a will of the wisp. It's a mirage on the horizon. Like, um, if America shows up and it's a constructive player, uh, and that's what people need. Um, mm -hmm. On the complex issues, on the issues of you know, financial governance, on the issues of you know, central bank activism, of course the Fed acts. We live in a dollar world. Um, but in a sense, that doesn't really need much coordination because the entire system is dollar-centric. So if... The U.S. acts, its domestic policy has complicated ramifications. Mm -hmm. if, if, when we're talking about leadership, I mean what we're, the, the really difficult issues which require multilateral bargaining, give and take, and, and those are extremely difficult to arbitrate. I don't think America's in any kind of position because what kind of bargaining power does it have? It can't deliver on trade. It's not a credible champion of democracy in the current moment. And in terms of security policy, it's evident that broadly speaking, except perhaps in the East Asian arena, the tendency is to pull back dramatically, right? There's a powerful impetus to withdraw. And, and so, you know, what, what America really has to offer there is, 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 is not very inspiring. That isn't to say that the world isn't in a mess and that we don't need concerted responses. It's just not obvious to me that, that those are going to come from a reassertion of American leadership. Mm -hmm. And I think the uh, tensions that you described in the book in one segment related to voter suppression and some of the structures in our Constitution might mean that there is a large majority of people who affirm the kind of vision and the leadership, but that isn't exactly what will translate into the electoral count because of this refractory process that is allowed to continue to blossom. I mean, I do think, I mean, I've been preoccupied with this question in a sense, going back to this book I did, Deluge, about the, you know, the, the rise of America to prominence in global affairs in the course mm -hmm. of World War I. It's not there in 1914, but by 1916, America is the, the pivot by 1916 of, of everyone's strategy. And, um, you know, in the, in the treaty fight of 1919, when Woodrow Wilson has propagated the idea of the League of Nations, the, the world is watching the, the most difficult treaty ever bargained over, the Versailles Treaty, 
incorporates the League of Nations with the United States at its core, and he brings it back to the recalcitrant Republican-dominated Senate. The Republicans won the midterms in November 1918, and they sink it. <laughs> and, and um, you know, it, forget Paris in 2015 and Trump exiting. I mean, this is, this is like the entire fabric of world order in the aftermath of the greatest conflict in the history of humanity to date hinges yes. on America's presence. And America just says, oh, oh sorry, no can do. Why? Well, this constitution of ours, you know, this issue of like division of powers and then the electoral politics of the United States. America is profoundly problematic as a global hegemon because of the structure of its of its constitution. It's not in the simple mm -hmm. sense, you know, a sort of elite governed imperial structure like Britain was for a while in the 19th century. It's something much more radical than that. Mm -hmm. And very difficult to manage and it is I think entirely conceivable both in terms of its global leadership role and also in terms of the development of its own democracy that we can see very bleak counter-majoritarian in fact you know, it's quite obvious that the the Republican Party is dedicated to securing its grip on power by all means necessary including the subversion mm -hmm. of the democratic process in the US the, the, the question that follows on from that is you know, what is it that we gamble on here? Like, do we gamble on some sort of convulsive moment of refoundation, a uh, civil rights moment, a New Deal moment, a civil war moment, heaven forbid, a kind of Bruce Ackerman style shift in the gestalt, in the frame of the American constitution? Because old as it is, I think it's probably the oldest operative significant mm -hmm. constitution in the world. Of course, it's constantly modified. But are we like realistically imagining that scenario or from the point of view certainly of global stability might one conceivably think that the continuation of a incoherent decentralized structure of power is in fact you know the best we can hope for and in some sense the safest because remember the countervailing power that this exercised on the Trump administration so there are checks and balances here, and they cut both ways. When the Democrats expect to have power, of course, it's all profoundly frustrating. But when they don't, living in a city like New York, it was profoundly comforting to know the limits of federal power over yes. our city and our state. And when you think about issues like climate change, again and again, you'll see people make this move where they'll say, well, America's going to do this. And then people will say, but what about the Senate? And then they'll say, well, we can't ratify anything, but we'll sign up anyway. And then they'll say, but what about the next election when the Republican is elected and he'll just pull us out? And then they say, oh, well, sub subnational actors will continue. You know, And that is a polite way of saying that the American national apparatus of government is a busted flush as a vehicle for sustained progressive politics. It may simply not be functional. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the problems are urgent and we need to keep moving on them. And we know, you know, if the coasts move on climate, it's a very big piece of the global puzzle because their economies are as large as large European states. In fact, yes. you know, the East Coast is larger than almost all of Europe. Um, same for California. So. I do think we're in a world, though, and you say, you know, I don't project forward, but I think even in our present moment, we can see truly radical contingencies, truly radical ideas, uh, possibilities um, for America's political economy in particular. Yeah. Well, you mentioned also in the book that uh, what you might call the Biden group is not really the left. You talked about Bernie and some of the climate issues or Elizabeth Warren and whatever, and how what is in power is much more what you might call a centrist working with the existing structure and trying to calm it down a bit, albeit I take your point about 2009 where the, de the look for a consensus then damaged the speed and the size of the response. Now they really put something out there. But, but I sense that, which you might call that characterization of the Democrats as the far left, is not particularly accurate in terms of how it... Uh, no, I mean, the Democrats have become a, a much more multivocal party. I mean, I think that's the, that's mm -hmm. the significant thing to say, right? Is mm -hmm. that 
that the, the party disciplined, as you say, in the wake of the Reagan shock to create the Clinton coalition, and then even more under Obama, was mm -hmm. a very streamlined, centrist, um, you know, for want of a better word, a, you mm -hmm. know, protagonist of neoliberal economic policy and social policy in the United States, people like the Hamilton Project, you know, down into the details of how they conceived social policy as working, public-private partnerships operating, incentive structures, nudge, the whole, you know, the whole, this was the repertoire, because in a sense, the Republicans have defaulted on governance in the United States for so long. Mm -hmm. It's the Democrats who've been doing the governing, and it's the sort of economists that work with them, and they come from places like MIT and Princeton, um, mm -hmm. and, and that is the heart of governance in the United States. And what's happened in the wake of the bitter disappointment on the left with the, especially the second term of the Obama administration on the one hand, and then the loss to Trump, is uh, an opening to the left and the, the formation of a substantial, it's not, you know, it doesn't have the same heft as the extreme right wing of the Republican Party has had at times, mm -hmm. but it has some leverage. And so you now, I think, you know, the minimum level of complexity you'd need to model the Democratic Party would be like a threefold typology, right, with, with a left wing, which is potent and strong and, and smart and full of ideas and generating ideas all the time. It's where all the ideas come from. Um, the right wing, the mansions of this world, and, you know, who we're, we're grateful that he's there because West Virginia would otherwise return a Republican. But nevertheless, you know, he's our conservative within the Democratic Party camp. And then you have the people in the middle who are, you know, the Bidens, the Yellens of this world, who I think are manoeuvring. Mm -hmm. Smart enough to see where the wind is blowing from, easily smart enough to recognize some of the deficits of the centrist policies of the Obama period, and also smart enough to recognize the force of many of the ideas coming from the left, which are, to be concrete, things like antitrust with, you know, Lena Khan being appointed mm -hmm. to such a prominent role and, uh, and Tim Wu or um, Gensler in the, in the banking regulation, some really powerful yes. stuff could come out of there, that he's a tough guy when it comes to these kind of issues. Mm -hmm. um, but more broadly, you know, on, on climate, um, there is, you know, the, the Green New Deal advocates lost, and this is one of the sort of historic frames of this book. The, the Green New Deal lost on both sides of the Atlantic, both in the UK and the US, but it's mm -hmm. quite clear that its strategic diagnosis was spot on. Like it, it, yes. it said the yes. Anthropocene poses fundamental problems. You know, it, it impacts a society which is profoundly unequal and shot through with massive instability thanks to the nature of the capitalist system at this moment. And in responding to this, we cannot be hamstrung by a set of outdated economic ideas which were already empirically voided in 2008 and institutions like INET have done a profound, powerful counter-hegemonic job over the decades now in shifting that conversation. And they were right on all three counts. I mean, they didn't quite understand any more than any of the rest of us that the most urgent problem from the Anthropocene wouldn't be climate. It was going to be a virus, and it was going yes. to move at the yes, speed yes, of a blitzkrieg, right. not trench warfare. But, but nevertheless, they, they understood that you know, that is the strategic challenge going forward, is somehow trying to find a way of rebalancing humanities and the economic system's relationship with nature. Yeah. And that therefore we would need to do big things. And if other big things were going to happen one way or the other, and it was a question of whether we got to control what the big things were and what direction they went in, and that we, that ideology, old fashioned, austere ideology could not stand in the way. And and, and the centrists, on both sides of the Atlantic, um, you've got to give the Europeans credit this time too, have kind of got it. Like, they're not going to, you know, but Ursula von der Leyen came as close as she possibly could as a, you know, she's a conservative, she's a Christian Democrat, you know, and she's calling her thing a green deal. Like, everyone knows, and they occasionally you'll hear slips of the tongue and they'll accidentally say new deal. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's clear that that is the diagnosis of now... A broad stretch, not just of the far left, but of, you know, green modernization, green capitalism. And it extends quite easily then. And this is where the new battle starts, not just the political, naked political battle to survive, make democracy survive, but the battle about policy is like, what is the relationship between that agenda and, say, Larry Fink? who, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. helpfully comes along and says, look, we want you to re-engineer the Bretton Woods institutions to absorb all of the risk whilst we go and do adventurous stuff realizing the sustainable development goals. I mean, you, surely this is an offer you can't resist. I've got trillions of dollars. You've got problems which are that kind of size. You don't have it on your budgets long term. 
all you need to do, let's do a little bit of engineering here. You take, you backstop all of the first risk or all of the really bad stuff we don't want to. Yeah. And we've got ourselves a bargain, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, mm -hmm. that's where the real fight starts, you know, yeah. because we may have to use that kind of a structure but you and I both know that you then need to get the devil's in the detail. The devil is in the engineering of That's that, right. backstopping of it, and the to ensure that you know yeah. that, yeah. That there's an equitable bargain here between yes. stakeholders. I've been involved in some conversations recently that are related to uh, development and climate change in Africa. Yeah. And the argument that is being made is that uh, I'm being kind of facetious, but in Norway, about a third of the year, it's dark all day and night. Mm -hmm. So you put up solar panels in Norway and you pay 100 basis points more than the rate of inflation, mm -hmm. maybe. When you go to the African continent, the solar panels are much more productive mm -hmm. all year round. And you're asked to pay 800 basis points over the rate of inflation. Yeah what they might call a political risk premium. Yeah. So the question is, how can the multilateral institutions bear some of that risk? Because it's not just being a do-gooder and benefiting the African people, though that's important too. What it's doing is it's saying, we're all gonna survive yeah. if we can get that financed and it's worth our bearing that risk premium yeah. collectively. Yeah. And yet, like you said, the details, the enforcement, the mechanisms. Yeah. People don't know how to do them. Yeah, I but, mean, I, I discuss yeah. in the book, I talk about the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. They've got this uh, very yes. dynamic group, Vera Songwe, who's been very proactive. And um, they're fascinating people to talk to. And um, mm -hmm. uh, I actually organized a meeting with, with her and her team and people like Daniela Gabor. And, um, and we had a, you know, a very frank exchange um because their position i mean the african position is is kind of radical i mean a it's got that backdrop in other words look sustainable development goals you know what the demographic challenges of africa are we've got you know we will be the largest slice of the working age labor force in the foreseeable future this is the dynamic leading edge of the world oh, we yeah. have these pressing problems we need capital we don't want to talk to you about you know sovereign default and how you restructure debt you know so there will be some countries that will have to do that. You don't understand. What we need are trillions of dollars and we need them fast. Right? Mm -hmm. and, then you, and then you say you can't do that. And we say, Italy. I'd like to talk to you about Italy. Right? Italy has a debt to GDP ratio in excess of 150% of GDP. And its medium uh, term bonds are now trading at negative yields. Now, we all know that Italy has got virtually no nominal GDP growth prospects, despite the magic that Mario Draghi will work in the next gen EU. Everyone in their right mind knows that that is probably not going to work out and there's going to have to be some solution of some kind. If you can engineer that for Italy, why on earth can't you engineer that for Ghana? Look mm -hmm. at Ghana's growth prospects by contrast. Catch-up growth, dynamic, yes. youthful population, relatively good governance, much mm -hmm. better macroeconomic fundamentals than, than, than Italy oh, in terms yeah. of debt to yeah. GDP. The difference is you will engineer the risk out of Italy's sovereign debt and you say you can't do it when it comes to Ghana. We're calling your bluff. If you're serious mm -hmm. about this, engineer the risk out of this. Yes. Right? And, and, yes. and it, uh, to my mind, I mean, I understand because the left purists will come in and say, oh, we shouldn't do this. Like we're incorporating vulnerable low income countries into a fragile structure that we know can blow up. Why would you want to create a repo market for African sovereign debt? We know what repo markets do. They're pro cyclical. They're a nightmare when crises break out. Surely we need to go down a healthier structure. We should have either, you know, proper sovereign default mechanisms like Brad Setzer and people like that were working on for the G30 or Daniela Gabor and folks will argue for a big green government, like proper public sector engagement. But you say this to the Africans, and they go, who are you kidding? We know you're not coming with, you know, A, we don't want to do, we don't want to talk about debt default. We need to move forward, not backwards. And we do not believe you'll ever arrive with trillions of dollars of properly multilaterally backed government funding. That's not, that's the Chinese have done a certain amount of this and you, 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 you try and repress them as much as you possibly can and try and outcompete them. 
when the G7 got together in Cornwall and did this, you know, B3W, Build Back Better World thing, it's quite clear they were talking public-private partnership leverage deals exactly the same mm -hmm. time that the Africans are talking about. So mm -hmm. the future, I think, is there. It's terrifying because we know, I mean, Daniela and, and Gabor and folks like that are absolutely right. We know how fragile these structures are. But given the obstacles to large public budget expansions everywhere in the world, this may be our best bet. And uh, I mean, I think that to me adds to the fragility of this, right? The way in which we engineer our way out of these massive structural problems that you and I started by talking about is by further complexity, further elaboration. I don't see there's any way out that goes back to basics. I, I'm profoundly mm -hmm. skeptical of the you know, this vision that somehow, I mean, this isn't to say that we don't need better sovereign debt restructuring mechanisms. Of course we do, but they need to be harnessed and they would presumably be an integral part of mechanisms for generating huge quantities yes. of new leverage because because yes. that's, we need to direct it properly and put it in the right direction. Because as you say, the, 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 the growth opportunities there ought to be gigantic. Yes. I, I'm laughing as I was listening to you because one of my friends actually in the UK who works on climate issues brought up the idea of Italy versus Africa. And he said, you know why? And I said, no, why, why will they do Italy but not Africa? He said, oh, that's simple. Because the fashion district in Paris has to compete with the Italian fashion district. And the German manufacturing, the middle stock competes Italy. with the manufacturing in northern Italy. So if Italy breaks out of the system, all of these places get crushed. And he said that is part of why they all put Europe together. They're not going to let it fall apart, but they don't fear Africa right now. And I said, what if they turn off all the oxygen on planet Earth? Shouldn't you be afraid not of the Africans, but of structurally well, that prospect? We, we, and he said, no, nah, no, nah, they're not afraid of that. Well, the, the, this has been played out too. I mean, this is a historian. I mean, what fascinates me is, as you say, I'm not about predicting, really. Yeah, but what yeah. I'm really interested in is, as it were, surveying reality to just see what we can see. And it is mm -hmm. truth so much stranger than fiction. Like, <laughs> you know, Germany's development minister went to Africa in 2016, 70. Germany had the presidency of G20 just as Donald mm -hmm. Trump was coming in. Yeah, and yeah. Germany, in the wake of the refugee crisis of 2015, had done the math and connected up the dots. And it said, you know what, we can think of one incredibly important reason to be worried about Africa. It's migration. Full stop. And the German Marshall Plan with Africa, it's not the Marshall Plan for or in, it's the Marshall Plan with Africa in 2017, was explicitly motivated. This, I think he was a CSU, like a German conservative, went to Africa, just blurted it all out. And he said, look, there are two reasons I'm here. It was like, the Turks, the Russians, and the Chinese will be here otherwise. And B, if I'm not here, you're going to come to us at some point in the future. So that's why I'm here. I'd like to do a Marshall Plan. <laughs> and it's just, like, um, I mean, that is the logic, right? I mean, he spells it out in a crude, racist kind of fashion. But the reason why, especially Europe and in the United States, this is true clearly for Central America and Latin America, given the climate shocks which are coming our way, the rich countries of the world have a absolutely overriding interest in, in this is not only that the business opportunities will great, it's such a negative way of thinking about your relationship with Italy. I mean, why don't mm -hmm. they just expand aggregate demand in the Eurozone and then they don't need to worry about Italian competition? I mean, that's a typical kind of bad mercantilist kind of logic. A, there is a huge growth opportunity here for people that will buy increasingly sophisticated products and the Chinese understand this and for some reason we are slower. And, and, but the second reason is and it's not even, you know, it, it's also, I think, a question of identity. Who do we want to be in the West 20 years from now? Do we want to be the people who saw this problem and assisted constructively, imaginatively, and at some risk, at some financial risk to ourselves in addressing this issue? Or do we want to be fortress North America, fortress Europe? Do we want to see not tens of thousands, but hundreds of thousands of people dying in the Mediterranean? Uh, or in the deserts of, of, uh, uh, of North Africa, which are going to become more and more uninhabitable as the climate, as the, as the, as the planet warms. Like, right. 
the the this is we should consider this um there's no safe place here right and 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 so the the options are do we embrace this in a constructive positive way also collaboratively mm-hmm. or um are we essentially opting for the bunker strategy because that's what mm-hmm. i think if we do not grasp this development problem that's essentially what we're opting for and that is that's in a sense the most grim prospect, right? Because we are then essentially going to sign up to an ever greater extent of the kind of continuous chronic abuse of human rights that goes on on the borders of all of the rich countries around the world right now. Yeah, for sure. Let me, uh, I say, put the triangle back in place because we've been in depth in the United States. We've been exploring Europe a little bit. We've talked about US, China. You talk in your book about the CAI agreement between Europe and China. Mm. We're now looking at a place where I've done conferences in INET, which is China's relationship to African development, Mm. the competition with the United States or Europe. In this three, I'll call it three player game and related to Africa, but US, EU, and China. Do you see the potential for collaboration? Do you see a coherence that creates a potentially a multilateral system. You've talked about essentially, how would I say, isolated China trying to overcome the middle income trap inside. They have faith in economies of scale because their population is so large. Mm. They're working towards more of a knowledge intensive Mm. education system and all. So they may shut the doors and go inward if this system continues to sputter or be acrimonious. Europe, United States could each go in different directions and could have three or more little spheres mm. that are not really interacting at a, uh, how do you say, mutually nourishing level. Yeah. So where, where do you see what I'll call this three-player game? And again, driving through Africa, where the Chinese have been playing a very active role in ports and transportation and roads and so forth. What, what's it look like to you, given your historical understanding? Mm. I mean, I, I think we, we I'm, I'm continuously amazed, I must admit, by the, the way in which this continues to be discussed in the United States, you know, as we speak. Mm-hmm. In the, the sense is that, um, you know, with Trump gone and the kind of loony tone removed from American policy that, you know, that we were in a sense in a sort of stable space and if we don't talk, well, then we don't talk, but in due course we will talk. But um, Huawei just launched a new phone and it's a 4G phone. And I don't understand why that's not, like, headline news. Um, Mm, mm. Because what that is is the first sign that the the war i describe it in the book as an economic war and i don't think that's a misnomer the open declaration by the united states that it's not willing to tolerate the use of western technology in chinese tech development even at its current level let alone beyond its current level is a historic break and, and mm-hmm. the Biden administration, by continuing the status quo, and in fact, in certain technical respects, tightening it, is underwriting that break. I think Beijing was waiting to see whether they would. And what I don't even seem to see, at least in the public debate in, in, in Washington, is a recognition of the gravity of that, of that situation. I mean, if you've got your the global leader in 5G technology reduced as a direct result of targeted American sanctions on frankly weak evidential basis, like circumstantial potential risk that Huawei technology poses to an also ran in in the race, in the smartphone technological race at this moment, in a matter of a year, right, from a from a leader last year to, to an also ran this year. I mean there isn't going to be a whole hell of a lot of room for debate about other stuff with regard to, you know, mutual collaboration with the United States. We just targeted and took out the leading edge of one prong of technological development. And I would expect Beijing's relationship to any offers to be utterly tactical, totally cynical, all bets are off. You people cannot be trusted as far as we can throw you. 
we are at war, we're not going to declare it, we're just going to play for keeps now. Um, mm. Because you can't do that. I mean, it's, it's astonishing. And the Americans will come up with lots and lots of reasons, you know, you know, spying, everything else. But GCHQ in Britain monitors Huawei religiously, and they never found the smoking gun. There is no smoking gun. What everyone knows about Huawei is it's terribly, terribly vulnerable technology. It's very poorly engineered software, and so anyone can break into it. And there is a long track record of Western intelligence agencies breaking into those phones, as much as Chinese using them the other way around. And it's a big difference between blocking the sale of that technology in the West and surgically striking the chip supply that allows its manufacture and sale to other people, notably in Africa. Um, mm -hmm. And so I just like for me, it's why are we even there's a sense in which it's as though we absent mindedly declared war on China. And then we're sort of saying, well, where can we move forward on things like, you know, well, cooperation and development? I mean, Dutch firms, which were supposed to supply high tech, you know, these ultra sophisticated chip manufacturing equipment to China, now no longer will as a direct result of American pressure. If I was mm -hmm. Beijing, I wouldn't be seriously negotiating about anything from here on in. Yeah. I mean, genuinely, why would you? You'd be, you'd be utterly naive. I mean, it, as soon as China reaches the level of technology that America regards as in any way compromising, it's entirely selfishly defined. America must be number one on my watch position. You know, they, yeah. they, America avoids all, all normal commercial relations. So, yeah. so, I mean, sure. I mean, I think it may be possible to do deals with China where they think it's, you know, in their best interest. China, I think, has a powerful interest in addressing the climate issue because they are going to be massively impacted on it much more than we are. We should stop worrying about whether they're serious. We should wonder whether we are. <laughs> we should then yeah. ask what it is they might be willing to do with regard to development in other parts of the world because where we could maybe get some alignment is that the Chinese and us can presumably agree that we don't want Nigeria to migrate to a carbon heavy technology, which is where Nigeria would go if it could develop, right? Um, so those would be the sorts of deals that I think might be open, like the choices that China's going to make around the edges um, in relation to say, Pakistan's energy infrastructure. Um, that's where you would be looking for bargains. I, I find it the more you think about it and spell it out, the harder it is to imagine any bigger bargains. The really big piece of the puzzle is, of course, Russia. But it's so yeah. Yeah. Um, astonishingly remote as a possibility. But, you know, because what you would need to do is corral Russia by way of a Sino-European-American three-way. I don't mean, like, you know, that's, that's pigs, pigs will fly before that happens. Um, <laughs> So, so it's, it, it's, it, it's difficult to see a good way forward for, you know, grand worldwide decarbonization without cooperation with China. But I just think given the framing of Western, but specifically American policy towards China at this current moment, I'm not surprised the Chinese basically don't want to meet with Americans. Yeah. Well, and I, I spent a lot of time over the years in China and I hear from their leaders, very high level people in their country that I've been meeting with, they say, first of all, the hostility that's being directed at us by someone like Donald Trump mm. is really related to the fact that we were a large country with a per capita income 1 40th of America in the 1970s. When you engage in globalization, the punchline as an economist is everybody can be better off and nobody worse off provided you make the transfers, mm -hmm. provided you make the adjustment assistance and transformation. And the people, the American people should be mad at no, right. are the people who made a lot of money and then lobbied in order to get their taxes cut and keep their money offshore and gut our education system. And so it exacerbated the inequality. And and the introduction of China into globalization played a role in that, but the people responsible for ameliorating it were the Americans. Okay. And then I go to the second page, which is the China 2025 report came out a few years ago. And you could see, whether it's reports at the Council on Foreign Relations by Blackwell, Campbell, and others, all before Donald Trump, 2014, 2015, and they're saying, whoa, these guys aren't going to fall in line. 
according to traditional comparative advantage, they're going to compete in cybersecurity, in finance. They're not going to let Wall Street into the market so that, in essence, our comparative advantage is there. They are going to ask for technology transfer, and then they're going to replicate the firms from our foreign direct investment and push us out. And there was a, I won't call it a panic, but there was a great sense of sort of an awakening that the Chinese had a strategy that the Americans couldn't accept. And it feels to me, now, you know, Dean Baker, the Washington, well, he was in Washington at CEPR, he's often said to me and others and written that you got into a situation between the United States and China where the Trump people were negotiating on behalf of the people with intellectual property rights or Wall Street but inflaming the white working class that lost in yesteryear. Mm -hmm. But what they're negotiating for is, is entertainment, pharmaceuticals, finance, yeah. all these high margin yeah. services. And if, even if you win on those things, you're not going to ameliorate what you might call the woundedness of the distant past, which takes you back to where the Chinese say that was the responsibility of the American Elites and when friends of mine that worked in issues like should China be called a currency manipulator, they said the chief lobbyists on behalf of that were people like Walmart and Nike saying, No, we don't want them to have to make their currency rise because they made money. Yeah. And uh, so it's a very, very uh, difficult place. I'm talking about economic policy, not human rights policy. Very difficult place for anybody to stand on a moral high ground. But I, I really do agree with you that this is uh, what you might call, it, it's hard to see a way forward, mm. given the, the woundedness and the aggression that's in play at, at present. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm not, I go back and forth on the whole China shock, you know, discourse in the United States, um, because it's clear that the, you know, David Alter's walk is in the end extremely persuasive, that there are bits of the American economy and American society which had massively impacted. Um, but he's a very careful analyst. He's a very careful sociologist and economist and a brilliant uh, analyst. Mm -hmm. And he'll go on immediately to say but one, one of the reasons why they were as impacted as they were is that they were already weak. These were already fragile communities that were destabilized by the yes. previous waves of globalization, on, by, you know, from Japan and then from NAFTA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and evidently, as soon as you make the comparison between the China shock which hit, you know, uh, the United States, bits of the United States and say Europe, you, you'll see how differently societies can react to these sorts of globalization shocks. And in aggregate, it's quite evident that the, globe, that the China shock is nowhere near large enough to explain the sudden surge in inequality in the United States or right. the disempowerment of the right. American labor movement. Yes. And so there is then a, to my mind, extremely significant question about, as it were, the political responsibility of expertise and critical, unorthodox, heterodox expertise in particular in how it feeds into a conversation like this. Because mm -hmm. it, it can obviously be used to say the Chinese did this, they destabilized the American working class, and therefore XYZ policy ought to follow. But you could also say, you know, there is this shock. What are we going to do about it? How large does the adjustment have to be internally? And how could we make our working class, ordinary working Americans, better equipped to cope with this kind of shock and that was the mantra for so long of you know Krugman in the 1990s and the Hamilton mm -hmm, project in the 2000s mm -hmm. and they just simply failed to deliver at scale right? yes. they don't actually deliver the scale of support that would be necessary to offset so then you find yourself in a sort of third best fourth best world in which substantial and politically important working class constituencies in the United States are objectively suffering very badly and it is as a result of Chinese imports um, and then you have to do something about it, right? And then it becomes almost irresistible to make this move to saying, well, in that case, you know, a progressive politics is harnessed to a protectionism. And, and it, it's, it's, a, it's as exactly as you describe it, a kind of progressive disablement and a narrowing of options, which if the entire problem had been addressed in a, in a more intelligent way earlier on, in a way which 
would would not be foreclosed. But but of course this is multiply over determined because the reason why the response was as weak as it was and as effectual as it was is to do with the class politics of the United States at that moment yes. and the story that we were telling earlier on about the shift in the balance of power within the leadership of the Democratic Party towards a much corporate, much more corporate, much more elite level. I mean, you know, Tom Ferguson, uh, you know, yeah. is part of your organisation has written about this as forcefully as anyone has. So it's... Um, it's a it's a it's a real impasse that we find ourselves in at this moment. But I find it is not it's not it's not. Again, we need to factor in another element here, right? The truly, as it were, non-negotiable element of this relationship isn't to do with working class jobs, right? The, the non-negotiation element of this is also absolutely nothing to do with soybeans and the sorts of things that Trump was doing his deals about. The, the non-negotiable element is to do with hard power in the military domain and it's tech and AI and everything that spills out from that. And that is not principally a matter of socio-political bargaining and, and class politics. It's a, it's a matter of the apparatus of the American state and its willingness to accommodate a multipolar world in which it is not the absolutely dominant, unchallenged, go anywhere, do anything military superpower that it has you know, come to expect that it is. And you know, a series of defeats in the Middle East have taught one set of lessons, and we're in the middle of witnessing the shambolic end of the, you know, the experiment in Afghanistan. And they're moving on to a new field of endeavour where they're going to try and confront, you know, China as a peer competitor, as they call it, as a facing challenge. And I think we shouldn't conflate there the different vectors. You know, in some sense, it would be good news if we were back in the domain of agricultural tariffs and, and jobs, because that would be, you know, there was an extraordinary moment, I comment on it in the book, in 2020, where... You know, Mnuchin and Lighthizer, who were previously the battering rams of Trump's aggression against China, Lighthizer in particular, less Mnuchin, um, were the last conduit of reasonable conversation between DC and Beijing, right? Because the burden of the conversation was being carried by Pompeo and Barr and, you know, O'Brien, these, you know, full on ideological hawkish warriors. And, and what's really striking is the Biden administration has taken no step back from that. So you'd expect them to double down on jobs. You'd expect them to double down on the blue collar issues. But, but, but that isn't the striking thing where they've stayed, you know, where they've held position is, in fact, on the tech war stuff. Well, I think uh, you're characterizing this very well. And I would... How would I say? Uh, I think we're going to have to wrap up here. But I would say I was inspired to become an economist. I thought I was going to be a ship designer by Charles Kinderberger. And I took his course in European economic history and another one that I wrote a junior paper on how maritime technology affect the pattern of trade between the Dutch and the British empires. And uh, but he inspired me to become an economist. And every time I listen to an economic historian, I just wish that we could integrate more history into the curriculum, along with the history of thought, along with all the analytics. I, I think it's a shame. I took economic history from Lester Chandler. I took history of thought from Will Balmo in graduate school. Charlie Kindleberger brought me to it. So I've enjoyed listening to you today. In this cauldron of not knowing, I always think about musical thoughts or lyrics that come to my mind. And as I was listening to you, it reminded me of a song by U2 called City of Blinding Light. And in the first verse goes, the more you see, the less you know, the less you find out as you go. I knew much more then than I know now. And your humility in saying, in essence, past isn't always prologue, I want to contradict slightly because I think the patterns and the interactions that a historian sees in integrating, being what you might call organically multidisciplinary, is very helpful to an economist. Mm -hmm. And I, we may admit that we knew more then than we know now. Well, we may know more about the history because the history's over than we know now about the present and the futures because it's still in play. 
That humility is important, but the depth and sensitivity with which you approach analysis is a really great example for young people to emulate. So thank you, very much. thank you for being with me and thank you for the work that you do. And I look forward to the next time we can talk. Me too. Thank you. Yeah.